everyone, Alec Alger the Sidequest Gamer here, and you're all probably waiting for me to explain why I love Mega Man X2 the most in the franchise, even more than the beloved X1. And I'm not going to waste any of your time, I'm going to jump in right into the review and explain why I love this game the most in the franchise. So let's roll the footage and check it out, shall we? Mega Man X2, what can I honestly say that hasn't been said before? Well, everything, because when looking up reviews of this game, there were only like 3 or 4 that popped up if we're counting YouTubers with high production values. With the exception of Retropolis Zone, whose review I highly recommend checking out. Everyone pretty much said Mega Man X2 wasn't as good as the first, but still pretty good. I also saw many Let's Players pretty much say the exact same thing, so I can only estimate that the general consensus says that Mega Man X2 is not as good as X4, and especially not as good as X1, but better than X3. It's basically a mid-tier ranking game in the X series. I've also met quite a few people who say that Mega Man X2 was boring for not innovating that much from the first and was just more of the same. I can understand that, but how could you follow up Mega Man X? It was easy for Mega Man 2 to improve from the original in the classic series because the first one had so many problems, not to mention it didn't sell that well, so Capcom wanted Mega Man 2 to not only improve from the first, but also sell better, and it did. In fact, it's one of the best selling entries in the series. Mega Man X2 was again developed and published by Capcom. For the development of the game, Kaiji Inafune and some of the team that worked on X1 return, but were also joined by new artists, designers, and programmers that were new to the entire franchise. Usually that would cause for alarm, but I am glad that the new team members grew accustomed to how Mega Man X played. It's interesting to note that the character designs, Inafune wasn't even involved with a lot of those. Which would explain why Wire Sponge even exists. Inafune was instead heavily involved with the story elements of the game and even made the major decision to bring Zero back to life, thinking it would be a shame to leave him dead, which happened after Zero sacrificed himself to destroy Vile's mech armor in the last game. Other interesting things about the development to note were that the eight Mavericks were conceived by the best art submissions from fans of the Mega Man series. Like Mega Man 6's Robot Masters, fans would send in their ideas for, in this case, Mavericks. Okay, but who's the weird kid who thought of wire sponge? No, seriously, who's the weird kid who thought combining a wire and a sponge together as a maverick in this game? And who at Capcom thought that was a great idea? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It's so weird. But as for the rest of the character designs like, well, Green Guy, X-Hunters, and Sigma, that was all Capcom themselves that designed those characters. Of course, Mega Man and Zero, but those were designs from the previous game. Of course they'd be the same. The interesting thing about Mega Man X2 is that it utilizes a cartridge-implanted CX4 chip to render those 3D wireframes you see from the X logo at the title screen, the Sword and Magna centipede stage, and the final form of the final boss, whom I won't spoil, but... You can probably guess who it is. And whenever a Super Nintendo game has a chip enhancement of some sort, like Yoshi's Island or Star Fox, it usually costs more than the standard full price. And knowing video games back then range from fifty to ninety dollars, it could get expensive. And Mega Man X2 is still expensive to this day, just to buy a loose cart without the box or instructions manual. Just and I wouldn't mind that if the chip was used more than like three times in the entire game. As for the story itself, the game takes place six months after X killed Sigma and thwarted his insurrection with the cost of his partner Zero, but X is doing what he does best, and that's hunting Mavericks wherever they are. Six months later, X and another Maverick hunter, whom I'll call Green Guy for the rest of this review, they head for a factory that's manufacturing Maverick robots. As they head in, Green Guy's bike is shot down, while X crashes his bike into a turret. Rest in pieces, Green Guy. You did good today. With Green Guy dead, X avenges him by shooting everything in his way and taking down the giant Maverick at the end. With Giant Maverick dead and presumably the factory being put out of commission, three mysterious Mavericks watches X from a distance and make an elaborate plan to take X down. 
These three special mavericks are known as the X-Hunters, and let's just say they're quite prevalent in this game. Agile is the most agile, Sergis is the most technologically sophisticated of the group, and likely the brains of the operation, and Violin is the brawn of the group. After taking down your first two mavericks, the three X-Hunters go out to random stages and will intervene. Okay, maybe not in a random order, but they do change locations every time you enter or leave a stage. Although I always end up fighting the X-Hunters at the same exact stages every playthrough. You can challenge them if you go out of your way to find their doorways in each level, but some of them require power-ups to access them. Like, say if one of them integrates into Overdrive Ostrich's stage, you'll need Wheel Gator's power-up to open the way to X-Hunter's door. Now these guys are optional, but if you finish a stage with one of them inside without facing them, that X-Hunter will disappear until you re-encounter him at its corresponding fortress level, but this will abort the side quest. Each of them has one of the three Zero parts, and if you want Dr. Kane to rebuild Zero, then you'll have to have all three parts, therefore defeating these three X-Hunters wherever they appear. I like the idea of the X-Hunters, it could have been a lot better, because the reward for doing so is that you don't have to fight the second to the last boss, and knowing the second to the last boss is easy, it's kind of an underwhelming reward, and whether you fight the X-Hunters or not, it really doesn't change the ending at all. But as for the gameplay, it's fairly standard like the first game. You still have your Light Capsule Dash ability from the last game, allowing me to beat the intro stage quickly. The level design, I would argue, is an improvement over the first, at least to me, because stages like Crystal Snail and Overdrive Ostrich, and especially Wire Sponge, have some very unique gimmicks and obstacles that provided a new challenge for me to face. There's more emphasis on platforming in some of the levels, as well as finding ways to survive certain stage hazards, like in Crystal Snail's stage in the slide green platforms that'll crush you if you're not careful. I like how this game sometimes make you think outside of the box, especially if you want the 8 heart tanks, 4 sub tanks, and 4 light capsules. The levels aren't too short nor too long either. They just seem like the perfect length with the exception of Magna Centipede stage feeling like it takes a little longer than most stages, but even that wasn't bad. Unless you're dealing with a security obstacle since this level has stealth gimmicks to it. Some of the stages do have an improved mech armor that has a hover jetpack, and for those two stages, it made for some interesting gameplay, but like the previous game, it's not too memorable. Although, riding the hover bike in Overdrive Ostrich's stage was kind of fun with all the crashing into ramps and such. I also like the power-ups gained by enemies, as unlike Storm Eagle's tornado power-up from X1, none of the weapons in this game ever feels overpowered. Even Flame Stag's ability, which is in my opinion the best power-up in the game, even that wasn't overpowered. And as for the optional upgrades, they feel more useful than in X1. There's a leg upgrade that can make you dash in the air, which allows for some interesting platforming. The helmet upgrade helps you find collectibles throughout the level, which I don't use anymore because I know where everything is, but I will say I like it a lot better than the one and done head bash ability you only needed for the light capsule and flame mammoth stage in the first game. The weapon upgrade is just as good as it was in the first game, and the body upgrade, well, a little disappointing because the giga attack was only useful for Sergis and Fortress 2, it was still nice to have the screen nuke option in addition to taking less damage. The heart containers are well hidden, more so than last time. I stumbled upon the obscure wire sponge heart container by complete accident, and I won't lie, like last time, some of these need a guide in order to be found. Crystal Snail's heart container is said to be the hardest in the game to get, but I can usually get it in three tries. There is quite a bit of backtracking in this game, especially in Bubble Crab stage, which would require his bubble shield in order to reach the sub tank in that level. But like the previous game, it wasn't too bad. The amount of backtracking you have to do is entirely dependent whether you're willing to fight the boss without his weakness or not. I really don't mind backtracking if it doesn't take too long. In Mega Man's X1 through X4, backtracking should take more than like five minutes. At most. And once you get what you need, you can always exit the level with the exit option in the start menu, as long as you beat that stage's boss beforehand. I will say, getting the Shoryuken in this game doesn't even require going back to a previous level, unlike the Hadouken in X1. You do need everything though, and this time you need full health when reaching the location, and then you have to do the trickiest flame and air dashing, as well as not get hit by an enemy. Then slide down the wall and hug the left wall, 
and you'll have Dr. Light make a Wayne's World reference as he gives you the Street Fighter power-up that, like the Hadouken in the previous game, you'll need full health in order to use it. Too bad he doesn't shout Shoryuken as he uses it, like how he shouted Hadouken in the previous game, but oh well. But as for the Mavericks you fight in this game, the boss battles I like more than X1. While X1 had many that vary from extremely easy to somewhat tricky, X2 has more balanced boss battle difficulty, although Wheelgator and Violin are probably the worst in the game. Their attack pattern is either so random or tricky to dodge, or even both. And I like how the X Hunters themselves are fought in the fortress levels instead of mindless robots in their place, like that giant spider or whatever the heck that thing was in the previous game. It's probably due to the X Hunter's heavy involvement in the story and gameplay that made fighting them all the more worthwhile. I mean, they're what Vile should have been like in the first X game. Now as for the graphics of the game, I will say I do like the detail that went into some of the stages, most notably Bubble Crab and Crystal Snail stage. The backgrounds just look so amazing and the character sprites look just as good as they did in X. Are the graphics better than X1? Uh, I'd say it's more on par with the originals, maybe slightly improved, but like the graphics of Sonic 2 compared to Sonic 1, you'll have to look deeply into the textures and sprite work to appreciate the slight improvements in graphical detail, otherwise you won't really notice a difference. And the music, I will say that Mega Man X1 does have the better soundtrack, but I feel like Mega Man X2 gets the Metroid Prime 2 Echoes treatment, where not a lot of people truly appreciate the soundtrack on its own merit, just because of their lack of interest in X2 in general. The theme for the first and final stages is really hardcore and fast paced. I could not ask for a better intro theme than that. Just when I thought it couldn't get any better than that, but the X2 intro stage theme just works so well given the context of X waging war on the last of the Mavericks. I also love the Wire Sponge stage theme, I love the Hard Rock Flame Stag stage theme, the Boss Battles theme, which I wasn't a fan of at first, kind of grew on me after a while and does convey the current danger you're encountering. I also like the fast paced Fortress level themes and the somewhat atmospheric Bubble Crab theme. And let us not forget the Triumphant Zero theme. I, I just love the electric guitar and synthesizers used in that one track alone. Do I think the soundtrack is the best in the series? No. Although for X2, most of them range from decent to even great. But boy, do I like to listen to the Mega Man X2 music playlist from time to time on YouTube. But overall, is Mega Man X2 the progressive sequel X1 needed? Not in the vein of how Mega Man 2 improves so much from the original Mega Man, X2 doesn't even have so many reimagined elements of Mega Man 2 the way X1 was a reimagining of Mega Man 1. I mean, Wheel Gator's power-up is kind of like the Metal Blade, but functions way differently and is not overpowered. In fact, it's one of my least favorite weapons in the game. Flame Stag is kind of like Heat Man, but not really, other than that he's a second fire-based boss in the series. You do get a Crash Bomb-like power-up from Magna Centipede. Bubble Crab is kind of like Bubble Man since they have bubble-like power-ups, but the only reimagined element that is extremely similar to Mega Man 2 was the return of the boss rush room where you refight the eight Mavericks in one room before fighting the final boss, whom if you've seen the post credit scenes in X1, you probably know who it is. <coughs> And from a story department, X2 does follow up X1 pretty well. Rather than pretty much retell the same story over and over for each entry, X2 picks up six months later after X1 where X and the Maverick Hunters are doing what they do best, hunting Mavericks. I do like the characters of this game, the X Hunters, while we don't get much backstory on them, they start off as a conspiracy group watching X from afar. Rather than being arrogant, they actually believe X to be a genuine threat to them and even acknowledge his high skill not surprising them as to how he defeats defeated Sigma in the previous game. They even feel that X would probably kill all of their 8 Maverick underlings if they don't intervene and I just find it refreshing that the secondary antagonists would be humble yet confident at the same time, at least for Sergis and Agile. Violin, however, is confident that he'll crush X and of course the stupid Braun group member would be like that. 
Axe himself doesn't evolve like he did in the previous game, mainly because he isn't a rookie, but instead an experienced Maverick Hunter. But I don't mind that. He starts the game doing his job and ends the game as a victor over the Mavericks. And it is nice to see Dr. Kane in-game for the first time. Axe and the Doctor speak a few times, mainly involving the reconstruction of Zero, whether you get the parts or not. Although I find it funny that he's unintentionally cross-eyed. I don't know why. Perhaps a pixel artwork flub that somehow made it into the third game as well. And Green Guy, I like how he evolved from a sidekick that never speaks to scrap metal after he gets shot down, therefore empowering Mega Man X to avenge his death. I don't know, I don't even think X cares. <laughs> And while I do get why many people didn't like how the X Hunters were implemented with them shuffling their locations from stage to stage, and therefore prefer to replay X1 more than X2, I get that. But me personally, the X Hunters just made me love the game all the more. Sure, the payoff may be underwhelming, but it's optional, and if you're a side quest gamer like me, you love options. You love side quests. And with their weaknesses, they only take a minute or two to fight, so it's not like it interrupts the pace of the game. And overall, I would give this game a 97 out of 100. It is by far my favorite Mega Man game of all time, as well as my most replayed Mega Man game. I don't recommend getting a physical copy because, again, it's kind of expensive. Buy it digitally for 8 American dollars on the Wii U eShop because it's in an upscale resolution and you're getting a pretty solid Mega Man experience that's worth a weekend or two. Get the final entry in the Mega Man X cartridge trilogy, Mega Man X3. Join me next week as I'll be reviewing Mega Man X3, and for that review, I will be joined by Jay of Jay's Reviews once again because he put in 100 hours into that game, and he's quite familiar with the version differences between the Super Nintendo and the PlayStation versions. And we'll be reviewing both the PlayStation and Super Nintendo versions next week. And it's probably going to be a long 30 minute review at least, but trust me, you're not going to want to miss out next week. Yep, the audience definitely won't get tired of me, and maybe I'll get partial credit this time. Thank you guys so much for watching, and remember to stay awesome. Also, Jay, how did you hack my computer speakers and microphone, and how did you make it out of Aruba? I'll tell you next week. <laughs>